Well, hello, everyone. I'm Mark Turner. This is Eric Petro. Welcome to Music Talk at McNally. Thank you so much for joining us. Eric, how are you? I'm good. That's good. Yeah, it's nice to be back. We're farther apart than usual. We are. We, we've added extra precautions to this whole week. You, you even have one of the UV filters right at your feet now. I do, and <laughs> an extra two meters. You're very far away. I yeah. know. Yeah. 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 It's not It's not a social reason. It's just... <laughs> It's just, <laughs> just well, after a few years, yeah, who you know, knows? Well, yeah, yeah, you know. I mean, conductors, you know. Um, no, it's it's we've added extra precautions just because of the rise of variants in our city. We just want to make sure that we're keeping everyone extra special safe. So, um, so uh, hello from over here. Hello. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, uh, it's it's spring finally, which is really nice, and I think that this concert is so perfectly timed, um, and it and it because because this music is so spring effective and it makes up for not getting to do the mass and b minor exactly yeah it's there it's i've said this many times before in the interviews and that sort of thing it's 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 bach so of course there's depth to it but there's exuberance and there's playfulness and there's spring like feeling to it because it's just dances with joy yeah it seems weird to me that we were going to do the mass and b minor this week we were just before the camera started to roll we were talking about how strange this all feels, um, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about projects even even four weeks, five weeks away, and we're not sure whether we're going to be able to do it or not simply because of the of the pandemic. And, and to think about the fact that we were going to have like 40 singers on stage singing um, is is so weird. It is. And it's interesting because when we planned that last year or even two years ago and we chose St. John's, remember that, how. That was going to be oh our first time. It was going to be our first time. concert at St. John's in a long time. Exactly, and now that's we live there. <laughs> that's that's our place. Yeah, some of us actually live there. I think <laughs> it's just we moved in, put a little cot in the corner. It's simpler that way. Um, uh, yeah, and and it's it's been such a great home. A huge thanks to the folks at St. John's Cathedral. Mm -hmm. They have they have made us feel so welcome. They had the space we needed. They had the internet we needed, <laughs> which was a big part of streaming. So uh, and so a it's beautiful acoustic, beautiful acoustic to play around in. Uh, hilariously, I was thinking the other day about like if we ever were to do a choral work in that in that room, it'd be more challenging than we thought it would be. That's right. So, <laughs> so maybe this worked out for in our favor. Uh, it's such a live acoustic. So, um, uh, it was going to be the very first performance of Mass and B Minor by the SSO, which is kind of crazy when you think about how monumental that piece is. Mm -hmm. um, th this is actually one of the weekends that I do miss you know there's been a lot of the concerts throughout this year that we've had to replace that that it's been exciting it's been creative in a completely new crazy wild uh way this one was one of those concerts i really wanted this year well and it's it's like you said it's such a monumental work it's um and to uh, having it played for the first time in full in saskatoon that uh that was gonna be big and that was you know a lot of people over the years have been asking for it or they'll mention it here and there and to bring that not just stuff, no, <laughs> not just stuff, not just stuff. Workington, <laughs> her choir director. <laughs> That's right. And uh, it would have been, it would have been, uh, I think, pretty incredible. And I think, I think, what is exciting is that when it does happen, whether that's next spring or the spring after, or whenever we get to do large choral works again, it's going to feel even more emotional. I think. Mm -hmm. You're right. It's right, and that's and that's what this music is all about. It's it's connecting. Uh, to moments, connecting to life, connecting to people. And that's this whole pandemic, of course, has put us, or most of us, in a different frame of mind of how we live our lives. So I think that, like you say, will be even more special. Um, uh, not negating the specialness of this weekend at all, because actually, when, when it was funny when we, when we started to reprogram things and went, oh, it's the 300th anniversary of the Brandenburgs. How did we miss that? <laughs> Oops. We like to celebrate anniversaries in classical music, um, partially because some of them, you know, as we get into the life now of, of Bach and Beethoven and Haydn and Mozart, those are hundreds of years. They're not, you know, 25 years, 50 years. Those are 300 years since this piece was written. Um, and, and, you know, in the next few years, we're going to have those 300th anniversaries of the Passions and of, like, you know, Messiah, 300 years is coming up. Like, it's pretty phenomenal when you start to think about the amount of time these pieces have lived even though these pieces actually disappeared for <laughs> for many a years. long time. Okay, so let's let's dig into the history of them a bit before we actually talk about the music. Bach was working in Kirchen for uh, uh, for a ca for a Calvinist, mm -hmm. which meant there wasn't the opportunity to write the music he wanted to write. That's right. And and so Bach had about four or five main posts during his life. 
back then, how you made money was either through a court, uh, like a royalty, or through the church, or through a city, and you're in charge of the churches, whether it was Lutheran or Catholic, depending on where you were in Germany. And of course, Bach was more northern, so it was Lutheran. Um, but like you said, this count was Calvinist, and so um, the religious or the the sacred music wasn't that important in his in his um, uh, post there. Although, of course, you know Bach was, you know, a devout. He, he was a practicing Lutheran in a certain way, and so everything he pr he wrote was probably in that vein. But it wasn't specifically like his cantatas or the passions, like you mentioned, for the church or for for uh, with religious texts. And so these works, um, they're written for, well, it's it's the titles in French. It's you know for many uh, concertos for many instruments, and um, and they were given to the Margrave of Brandenburg slash Schwedt. Yeah, and so, and of course, thank God they're not the Schwedt concertos. Exactly, it's much easier. That would be. <laughs> not good. <laughs> and it's also nice that um, I looked it up, I think, last year, whether there's connection between the Brandenburg Gates in, in Berlin. And there is. It's not this actual Margrave, but there's someone in that line that it's connected to. But so he, he what's fascinating about this, this, it wasn't even a commission. It was just given to the Margrave, was the, the title or the letter that he sent along. And it's so verbose with, with this uh, just kneeling down to this person oh i'm you of course will not even um enjoy this please uh accept my apologies for even saying that i'm going to send this to you and it's 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 all of this which speaks to the time speaks to what the relationship between musicians geniuses like bach and the royalty at that time where royalty was he you know head and shoulders above pretty much anyone um, even God at times, <laughs> and, uh, and and musicians were basically servants, and and so this is fascinating. That have anyone out of you know not knowing anything about the Brandenburg Concerto, have you ever heard of the Margrave of Brandenburg Schwedt? No, but of course Bach is is famous, and so these works were given to to Margrave, but the Margrave he really didn't have a band for it. No, he just didn't have the musicians who could play it. No. And no. He, and he wasn't even that excited about No, he didn't really music. care. He, no. Because he didn't even try to put together <laughs> the band that could play it. <laughs> and I mean, there's there's a lovely story about other fact. He didn't have them at his disposal. He, come on, it was Germany. Exactly. Um, you know, like, <laughs> there was a lot of there was a lot of very talented musicians about. Exactly. And it was close. To didn't try. And it was close to Berlin. There was, like, a big center. Yeah. So he, he didn't even really care, which is even speaks more to it. These exceptional, genius masterworks, these six concerti, that were given to this person, you know, and they're just kind of like threw them in the closet and that was it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and really kind of shelved and not found until he, until he died in, in 1734? Uh, 1750 is 1750, when he died. Yeah. Okay. And, and, uh, and then, and then, and then uh, shelved once again. Yeah. Because nobody cared. Now, we think of Bach as a genius today, but he wasn't that famous in his own lifetime. No. I mean, his family was famous. His sons ended up being more famous than him, kind of in the immediate future. Um, but Bach, and it was I, I, you know Bach was was just like those pop stars or pop stars of today, where they have uh, this big, you know, he had a decent reputation. But by the end of his life, last twenty years, it was down. I mean, all the cool kids, like his kids, were taking over and, and producing much more. Um, forward thinking or hip music, um, but Bach was also he lived within this like 200 kilometer radius of, and sure he did go down and, and visit other parts of Europe, but um, it was pretty pretty uh, condensed to this to this area. He did once take a four month leave when he was supposed to only take four weeks to walk up 200 kilometers north to Lübeck to go visit uh, Buxtehude. Um, and then back, but um, he got fired for that. But um, but basically, it was around this area. So because there's no globalization or anything of the, the sort, his reputation was solid. But even for one post, he was passed over by Telemann and two other people before he got the post. And now thinking back, you think, what? Especially his influence over every single um, composer, basically, and musician that came after him, after he Mendelssohn revived him and and others took up the cause. Yeah. And, and I mean, Bach had quite a uh, fascinating life. 
Um, you know, over, over on our blog, we've got a thing about Bach and the plague because after his parents died, he ended up going to live with his eldest brother because where his eldest brother lived wasn't a plague city. Right. Um, and so, you know, the question has to be asked, would Bach have had the same musical upbringing had it not been for that decision to have him go live with his brother due to it being safe from the plague? Um, it's a bit it's a bit hilarious now, all these years later, to be living inside a pandemic where certain cities get hit harder than other cities. That's what they were experiencing at the time when Bach was like uh, 10, 11. Right. And, uh, and, you know, then he, uh, he, had a, he, had a, he had a colorful life for a guy who wrote church music. He did end up in jail at one point, mm -hmm. um, which is <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> Another one of those, uh, those uh, friction cases with his employer where he wanted to leave. The employer didn't want him to leave. And so <laughs> instead of letting him go, uh, when Bach threatened to go, he, he stuck him in jail. But eventually the employer said Let go. Him. He also had a duel with, yeah. um, um, so Bach, he could be crabby at times. And, but he was also, uh, he demanded the best of his musicians. And some of these posts back then, um, and probably even still, there weren't great musicians around. And so he, he had to uh, contend with these pretty much amateurs and he got really upset one day with this bassoonist and he called him a weenie goat uh, and we think it's because of the vibrato or something with his with his bassoon could have been his face we just <laughs> don't know <laughs> could have <been. laughs> and and <laughs> the weenie goat the bassoonist um decided to get his friends together and confront bach at night when bach was walking home in the town square and and said come on I challenge you to a duel. And Bach said, you bet. Let's go. Let's do it. And they, they, they got at it, but no one, was, uh, no one was killed, luckily. But Bach was reprimanded and not the bassoonist. And so Bach was like, what? Come on. And so he wanted to leave that post as well. And so, yeah, he had this, this life with 20 kids, 20 kids. you know, two wives. Um, uh, they, they, he didn't divorce, of course. They died. Uh, they died. Um, but 20 kids who, uh, like you've mentioned before, a few of them, Became quite well known. CP Bach, stars. yeah, yeah. Uh, w F H Wilhelm Friedrich. What's the H for? Heinrich, perhaps. I don't know. Anyway, but uh, famous. Uh, Christian. Yeah, Johann Christian. All these, all these uh, sons, and and he also did. He knew of Handel. They were going to meet once. They're about twenty kilometers apart, but they never actually did meet. But they both died from the same. Uh, complications of eye surgery from the same surgeon. Yes, by the you know surgeon. He was a quack, <laughs> and <laughs> barber surgeon. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so he went around, and he's it like, "It'd be too hard to make this uh, stuff up. I it know. would just be impossible." <laughs> we we had th there has to be a movie made of this, and and uh, they botched these the both of them. Two of the greatest composers that ever lived were their eye surgeries were botched by the charlatan, and. Um, and they both died from complications. Mm -hmm. Crazy. It's a, it's a crazy history. But like you said, this was music written for what we would consider today amateurs. I often think of that listening to, you know, it was just, we just had Easter. I always watch one of the passions over the Easter weekend. Um, and every year I sit there and think like, this was written for amateur church musicians. And it is some of the most demandingly difficult vocal, choral, orchestral repertoire ever and and he, he wrote it for these people who were just members of the church choir exactly and 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 no wonder no wonder that there's friction with his employers because the demands that he put on these people and you know we 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 mentioned we're, we're playing uh two three and five the concerti of the six and um and two it has one of the hardest trumpet play uh um parts ever written for trumpet for any for forever yeah Period. and exactly and not not uh, we're talking like you know hummel and haydn concerti all that no this is this is a crazy thing and bach did it to challenge uh former uh trump trumpet player in his band uh, to change his embouchure or to encourage him to do more with it um but <laughs> but he sure he kind of uh hit him over the head with a bat really uh, with the with the difficultness of it. It's fascinating because, I mean, the Baroque era was the time when, when concertos took off, particularly in Italy, as we saw with, with your last concert, the, the Carnival of Venice, which had all of these phenomenal concerti. Um, there's less, uh, I don't want to say less of a tradition, of con there's just a less of a volume of, of, of concerti in the German Baroque. Right. 
Um, um, and there, there seems to be quite a number more of the Concerto Grosso for, for, or, uh, for you know, the, the larger group. Um, these pieces in particular, I don't think they were written, like this is, they're numbered one to six, but that's not a chronological order. They weren't written at the same time. They were never actually meant to be a full set. Um, uh, and yet they are, they are exceptionally uh, virtuosic. And not and not and not just for the soloists either. I mean, the, the playing itself is complex and dense. It it is probably, uh, if not the greatest, some of the greatest Baroque concertos ever written, and showcases Bach at his most um, fantastical. Like they're almost too showy for Bach. Well, and and uh, as I mentioned at the top of of them with depth but exuberance and playfulness. Bach has that that way of writing in all of his music, where you know, let's compare it to to the other two master, or uh, there are more than two, but the other famous, really famous ones, Handel and Vivaldi. Vivaldi is flashy. He's 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 Italian. Take risks, break the rules, just go nuts, and that's very Italian. Natural drama. That's right. That's right. You have Handel, which has that German tradition, but also. Um, uh, uh, spice in terms of uh, like small phrases that excite us and go ooh ah ooh okay, but there's that German tradition. Bach is more settled in a way. There's there's um, I've mentioned it three times already, but there's a bit more of a, d a depth to it, and so and people uh, this used to be a big fad you know 30 40 years ago 50 years ago we c we talked about Bach being like a mathematician, where he put it all together, and sure, there is there is a lot of that because of his structure and the way he composes. There's a l there's a lot longer lines, a lot bigger ideas going and on. And people ask about like I let's let's dig into that a bit. So the math that was, I mean, it was a big focus 20, 30 years ago yeah. of his music. The counterpoint, um, uh, we understand what that means, but uh, I I I know a lot of audience members go what, um, right. and it's that it's that combination of notes. Uh, that that work mathematically as well as musically, and that's just how the how the scale systems are designed. That's right, exactly. And so it's 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 like you say, using those those scale the the different the twelve notes of the scale, eight plus the ones in between, using those in a structure so that when you write a fugue, a fugue is like a round where one starts, the next starts, and there are kind of rules to it where you you know what you're doing. In terms of, well, now you start the next fugal subject a fifth higher, you know, five notes higher. And so there's a structure to it. But the genius of Bach is how innovative it was every single time. And with these works, um, you do have counterpoint. You have all of that. And, and yet, and yet, it is so emotional. And I mentioned it already a couple times on, uh, on interviews where I find it, it's like a good novel. It's like a Michael Andache novel, really. This morning... In an interview, I think it's airing uh, tomorrow or something. I mentioned it's not quite Salman Rushdie, where you know Salman Rushdie, you kind of have to you have to make the effort to get in, yeah. and there it's fantastic. And once you're in, you got to not continue to work, but you got to be there. You got to be there the whole time. Present. Yeah, and it's it's a it you get rewarded incredibly. Michael and Dace, it's just so beautiful how he writes, so that you're kind of already in, but there's a depth to it already. It's not like a you know you take to the beach and just throw it away in a day. And so I find Bach that way. It's, it's, there's so many layers, it's so mathematical, but at the same time, so accessible, yeah. so joyful, so exuberant. Last night in rehearsal, I, was, I, I danced to music, uh, to, to Bach, because it's so, it's so, it hits the soul. These are deep, but they're less, they're less intellectual than some Bach. Mm -hmm. um, uh, they're less heavy. The I, I, to me, they sort of resemble more closely to that to that joyful exuberance of the Italian Baroque, that virtuosic drama, because they are they're consumable in that way. Right. Where other Bach pieces, you know, it's it's hard to sit down and listen to the Passion if you're not if if you're not as into it as I am. It's 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 not something you just <laughs> it's not easy listening. Whereas these pieces sort of are like they are they are consumable. They're 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 uh, I, and I hate when people say this. But they're evergreen. They they never age. Mm -hmm. They feel as fresh today as they probably did three hundred and some years ago when you put them on paper. Yeah. Um, and that's a fascinating achievement, mm -hmm. even for Bach. Mm -hmm. And and I wish they were played more. I mean, they're played a lot in, in particularly in Europe. Not as played as often in North America, 
No, because we have the system of of large symphony orchestras um, where when you employ you know 110 musicians for 48 weeks of the year, that's that's very it's it's it w North America has this tradition of of you know going big yeah. with them, and when you do baroque music, ah, you just kind of you leave yeah you do it once in a while but leave it there most of it's four seasons that's right that's right whereas in europe there's a lot of early music groups there's a lot of the the big groups will will you know um half it or go here and here and what's great about saskatoon is that we have the size and flexibility to do these sort of things so this year that's why we we were thriving with you know oh let's do this let's do this let's uh you know, use these musicians this way, and this this is very it fits very well these pieces um, to who we are. Yeah. So on Saturday night we open with Brandenburg number three. Mm -hmm. It is strings only with harpsichord. Mm -hmm. um, it is the the opening movement is is some of the most recognizable music ever written. It it's uh, it's been used so much in movies. Um, you know, I think almost every movie you've ever seen with a classy wedding in it has this music playing in it um, because it instantly it instantly feels like you've you've put on a fancy dress coat and you're and you're wandering about a garden party with a with a fancy drink in hand it's just it's so exuberant it is and the and uh, back back in my student days when I gigged a lot and did a lot of weddings this was we pulled this out and I have to I have to say playing it hundreds of times I still love it. Every time we play it, we it, they would request it. Yes, <laughs> you, you, you know, and and you just go nuts with it. And you're right. It's um, there are three solo violins, three solo violas, three solo celli, uh, bass and, and harpsichord. And this was one of Bach's favorites. And what he would do in this one uh, would lead from the viola. So he would he loved playing viola. That was his favorite instrument to play. Even though he's exceptional harpsichordist, which he did of course in number two. Um, and uh, but this one he led from the viola, and um, and you can tell, like you said, exuberance and joyfulness when the the solos are passed around to each person. And I've played this before on on tour and other uh, places, and every time, every concert, it almost be kind of a uh, the last movement can be very quick, and we take it extremely uh, fast. And when someone do a solo, you kind of look over and give them a little <laughs> wink during the concert because it's like nailed it, way to go! Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 a it's a fun piece. Do, do does Bach employ uh, those that fugal writing throughout? Does he what what tricks does he use in this piece? Because he Bach had his tricks. Definitely had his tricks. And yeah, he and he could he used them he used them with great liberalness. Yeah, <laughs> well, this one the the. In in three especially, he breaks up a long line between the between the um, instruments, and it's not always first violin, second violin, third violin. It's sometimes first. Ooh, then we're going to the third violin. Well, then the second violist takes it. What what's going on here? So it, you you have you're on your toes as a listener and a player, but to say where's where's the line going? And sometimes oh no no this is the the normal way, but then the next uh, phrase he'll switch it up, and. Um, so he uses, yes, there is, of course, counterpoint, but the way he breaks up the phrase or distributes the phrase is probably a better way to say it, um, is, is really fun. Yeah, yeah it is. Um, after that, we actually, we, we, ha we have a break from the Brandenburgs in the concert. We, we are joined this weekend by the SSO Brass Ensemble, who are rehearsing separately all week. Um, they've already had rehearsals, neither of us. <laughs> have been there or heard it, so. Um, uh, but they're performing actually not from the Brandenburgs, but rather a selection from uh, Wachetau, the, the great cantata. Um, and so they'll be, they'll be inserting that. Bach and brass is an instant, I I like it's amazing he didn't actually just write for brass ensemble. It sounds so good for brass ensemble. It's, you know, a lot of Canadians, a lot of us grew up with Canadian brass, of course, and hearing that. Chuck and the boys. Exactly. And, uh, and the, the, like you say, it just fits so beautifully. And, and you're right. You would think that because of that beautiful fit, he would have written so much brass music, but he didn't. And so to, to take the... Now, to be fair, they didn't have the same brass instruments no, we have. No, Even the trumpet then, the, the, the carillon and sometimes cornea de cotton. Like, it, there, we didn't ha he didn't have it at his disposal. No, you couldn't valve it like, like, you, like we can now. And so the, you know, Wachadau, of course, is the famous aria from the... And, and the chorale preceding it. And that's, that is, sounds, will sound sumptuous with the, with the brass. Yeah. 
Um, one of the questions we had the last time we had Brass with us, which was just a few months ago now, um, is our wind ensemble perform with the conductor, but the brass ensemble usually don't. And so the question was, <laughs> why do the winds <laughs> perform with the conductor and the brass don't? And I literally said to the patron, and I hope they're watching tonight, I said to them, well, it's a personality thing. Uh, but, but in all honesty, I mean, the brass players like doing it on their own. Uh, it's, 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 it's very common. It's very common, and, and it's a tradition. Like, yeah. the, you have the brass bands. And of course you have wind bands, but wind bands is different because you have, you know, when you're growing up in school and you go to, you know, you, you take band, uh, that's different than a brass ensemble. And that brass ensemble, the British tradition in other countries, but it's very heavily British, um, where you you sometimes have like a, a conductor, but it kind of more a time timekeeper up front. And this is their thing. And so I'll, I'll, I'll join a rehearsal with them on Friday and we'll collaborate but this music is so chamber music anyway that um that it's just it's nice to sit back and just uh yeah, that tradition of that of that brass ensemble without a leader is 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 always charming to see mm -hmm. that does not mean that they're better at what they do than the other groups of instruments but they they do have a have a wonderful time together working in that in that structure it's, it's pretty wonderful um then we do brandenburg five um, which again is also one of the. I mean, there there isn't really a, a a loser in the set of six, but five is is also one of the more famous ones. Um, uh, tell us, tell us. This is we start to get into more solos. We've added a flute. The violin steps out on its own. The harpsichord takes a very prominent role. Yeah. Tell us more about what makes number five unique. Well, number five is is. Um, like you said, the the soloist. So so what we're what we're doing with with two, being the most soloists, five fewer uh, fewer well fewer and then and then three no soloists well. But with Allison and Michael Allison on flute and and Michael on violin and S and Sophia on harpsichord, this is this is where um, you're getting into uh, the the basically the harpsichord concertos with with a massive um, cadenza and solos and the slow movements in two and five also are different than three. Three, Bach just wrote two chords. You could add a cadenza if you wanted. You, do, you didn't have to. Um, but in, in two and five, they're actually written out. And there, is, it's, it's, there are no strings, well, except the violin soloist, but you have this trio and you just let them do what they want. And their counterpoint is very, very important because of these soloists. And so it's different than three, where you have nine soloists. Here we have a lot fewer, and the 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 um, counterpoint between each one and the orchestra gets really interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it's it's. Um, I mean, again, the it's it's music that is often you, people instantly recognize it because it's used a lot of the time. Yeah. Um. Uh, not necessarily as frequently as we hear number two, which is what we close with on Saturday night. Uh, yeah. The the um. The closing movement of number two was, of course, made famous by Masterpiece Theater. Right. Um, and 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 there are many people who will instantly recognize it as, oh, ooh, fancy TV, <laughs> um, because that's what it was used for for so long. I really like we're 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 switching it up a bit and doing something that isn't as done as often and having the trumpet play part played on the horn. That's right. That's right. And so it, it over the years, as we mentioned earlier, it's one of the especially the third movement one of the uh, most difficult uh, parts. But there's also a version um, that the French horn is used. And Carol's done this a few years ago with the uh, Prairie Virtuoso, I believe. And so uh, we thought this would be really interesting because um, uh, we haven't had Carol, at least my concerts is- She's had a lot of solos. They've just not been stand, they've not been out on her own. Right. Um, but particularly, uh, well, even in the, um, in the uh, Onager at the beginning of the fall. That's right. And she had a stunning solo in the, in the Mozart Serenade this year. Sh uh, Carol's been playing uh, just amazing all year. So this is uh, another chance to, uh, sh I think she's forgiven us so far for making her play this. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is well. very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> we'll 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 and see you by Saturday. She's watching tonight. Thank you, Carol. Yes, um. thank you very much. <laughs> no, it's 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 a unique uh, unique thing to bring that horn in, but it's it's done it's done here and there, and it also has a unique color to it because the horn, of course, is a, is a bit of a um, darker color, 
than the high trumpet. And and so I, I'm curious to know how that will sound in in St. John's mixed with the other soloists as well. Yeah, it's gonna be a it's gonna be a uh, it's gonna be stunning in that acoustic. Uh, that is what that acoustic is written for. Um, uh, you you do get to see where Bach was going with with. I mean, some of the keyboard concertos already were already in existence by that point. Some of the later ones hadn't happened yet, I believe. Um, you see a musical development uh, in a sort here. It's not, it's not you know as ob as obvious from you know a as the cantatas, which you can literally mark his entire career with. But you do see this this unique sense of growth in an artist who was already uh, he, he was already firing on all cylinders. And wha what I love about Bach's output is it, it pertains so much to where his job was and what his jo uh, re responsibilities were in those, um, in, those, in those jobs. And, and so it's almost, we think of it as outbursts, but it was basically, oh, uh, we're not writing church music right now? Okay, let's go. Instrumental. Bam. And so it's, it's getting all this stuff out. And then, of course, in the cantatas, when he had the in charge of the four churches, uh, he went nuts with the cantatas and had to literally every week put those out and so it's it's really interesting to see like you said the growth of his artistry over the whole period but how it goes in kind of these big chunks along the and way these and these pieces sort of push the boundary less they they are more about about uh, architecture than 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 moving the art form forward i mean a lot of box music even today can sound quite modern um, you know, there's particularly in some of the piano works, the solo piano works, e even even the even the the, the passions. There's moments mm -hmm. that sound more 20th century than than uh, than 18th century. So it's fascinating to to think of these of these six little pieces, kind of middle of life, just incredible successes. Incredible successes, and and um, you can tell. He he probably had a joy composing them because the sixth is with violas, yeah. two viola soloists, which was not heard of, <laughs> and <laughs> since then, really, you know, the viola is not a big solo instrument. Um, we like to think so, us violas, um, at times, but we are we kind of know that's not the case. But here's Bach, you know, in in the Baroque era, doing a viola concerto or two of them, and actually, uh, there was one that was discovered when I was doing my masters that. Uh, brought up, and, and it, it might not originally have been viola, but we say it is. Um, and so this is, you could, I, I would like to think that there is a little, there's some some cheekiness joy to how he composed these or when he was composing them. Yeah, and and um, yeah, there, there's, there's you do get that sense of joy mm -hmm. that he just, he was, he was in a happy period of his life. Whether whether or not he was, I mean, he didn't seem to like it that much in prison, so yeah. who knows? And he didn't get the job in Brandenburg Brandenburg's or Schwed, so um, you know he, he maybe lucked out on that one though. So um, uh, with with uh, with these pieces, one of the questions that's come in from from the online, you can feel free to ask us questions in the in the chat, both on Facebook and YouTube. Um, one of the questions that came in was, have you had to rework these pieces at all for the for the cu current COVID orchestra size? Well, thankfully, no. Not at all. No, no. These pieces were written for little orchestra. Exactly. Yeah, and and uh, back in the fifties, forties, fifties, there was a trend to go big. They would fill out the orchestra, the strings. But no, this is what we're doing is basically how they're written. And of course, in the Baroque era, they they change things around. Oh, we've got a, a bassoonist here. Okay, you play the cello line. Great. Um, you and you and you. But um, this is a perfect setting and perfect uh, number for. Yeah. We of course are performing these entirely on on modern instruments. Yeah. They are there's lots of recordings for for period instruments. Uh, one of my favorite recordings of the Brandenburgs is actually Murray Pariah on a on a modern piano. Um, he put a group together because he wanted he just wanted to do it. It was, a, it was a fun passion project. It's strange, but at the same time, it's absolutely stunning because these pieces can do that, like you say. Music and and Murray put in a bassoon. And Murray Pariah is one of the most musical. Yeah. Pianist yeah, out there, innately musical. Oh. Um, do you have a favorite recording of the Brandenburgs? I love Trevor Pinnock's um, both of them. He has a um, uh, Trevor Pinnock is a is a harpsichordist uh, conductor, and earlier in his career, he he was head of the English concert uh, or consort, but it's concert, um, and it's wonderful recording from probably the eighties, I think. But then he redid them a number of years ago with a European Brandenburg orchestra, basically put together for the Brandenburgs. 
and they're just lively and wonderful, great sound, but there's also the Freiburger Baroque Orchestra. There's, there's a lot of groups, a couple of Italian groups that, that go crazy with it. There's a wonderful one by Tafa Music, or kind of its own, which kind of had a very heated debate. When was it? 20 years ago? 25 even? I don't know. On CBC when another conductor in Canada, who is not Canadian, um, had a had an on air not on air spat, but they they challenged each other to who which the audience who which which recording of their Brandenburgs uh, would they like better, and it was um, Tafa Music and then uh, National Arts Center Orchestra with uh, with with Pinky Zuckerman, and so anyway that was a uh, that was a good time back then. I also like Ensemble Caprice out of Montreal. Their recording oh. of the Brandenburgs are fantastic. Yeah. They're 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 crack they're like just crack fire. They're just wonderful. Um, one of the questions that's come in, are there Bach pieces you wish were performed more and are there some that you could leave alone for a few years? I know what I would say to this, so y you go. Yeah, you know, leaving alone I d because I I grew up as a violinist, I don't have to hear the E major violin concerto um that much anymore. I I I like it. I love it, but if if we want to play it, I'll play the A minor. Um but other than that, no, I love Bach's keyboard uh, music. I could hear that all day, every day long. That's that's that. Um, and the Passions, but the Passions, you know, and, and the Christmas Oratorio, those, when you hear those massive pieces all at one time, I think it's it's so rewarding and filling, like you mentioned before. And, and it'd be wonderful to hear those more often live or get a chance to, um, yeah. I, I know for myself, I would love, as a pianist, I mean, uh, and, and as someone who judges competition, I've, I've, I've heard the, the prelude and fugues to death. Um, not that they're not brilliant, but they are brilliant. I, w I would love to see more pianists playing the partitas, mm. the French suites, the English suites. That music is not done as often by young pianists and um, as, an, as, a, as a now older pianist. It, it's, they're just so, there's so much depth to them that you just don't get in the preludes and fugues. No, the... I think I think the B flat partita is is one of my favorite pieces, let alone Bach. But the B flat is 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 stunning. Like you said, the two and three part inventions, and the French suites, the English suites, incredible music. Um, uh, is there is there uh, one of the questions that's come in is I what is the sound difference like I for for doing these with harpsichord? Um, uh, they d the harpsichords don't have as much natural sound, um, and so. That works in these smaller orchestral settings because you can hear it in the larger orchestra. I, lo I love when there's, you know, uh, John <laughs> Adams has some pieces where it's like harpsichord <laughs> in the middle of like 110 other musicians, and you're like, well. Um, <laughs> could or, be. Or, or a 1976 uh, uh, video of Karajan and the Berlin Phil, <laughs> and there's a harpsichord, and you're like, uh, uh, is there, is there be, something be. going on? Could be. <laughs> Um, I, I, it's, I think it fits beautifully in a setting like this. Uh, first of all, the acoustic of, of the church, but also with the strings. Because harpsichords, are, it's the action is plucked, um, it lends itself. You can hear it's a string instrument, basically, um, as, of course, is a piano, but with, with it different, it, yeah. you know, as opposed to being hit and plucked. There is a beauty of that. And, and when you grow up associating that harpsichord sound with Baroque music, um, there's something very special about that, so it's it's really nice. In, intriguingly, we we play with an electric harpsichord, um, uh, w which is which is uh, kind of a, a wonderful instrument that was created um, uh, by uh, the, the name of the company's escaped me. Roland. A uh, Roland. It's a Roland, um, and and generously given to the SSO by the Stin family, um, that can do all sorts of things. Um, mainly, it can actually sustain sound and keep its tune which is a challenge for harpsichords. Harpsichords tend to, over the course of even one concerto, lose their tuning. Uh, and then, you know, and, and you and I have both been in situations where you, where <laughs> you sit in the audience as the harpsichord tunes. Uh, you know, particularly, I, I remember a concert in Europe that, that's, that we I think we spent as much time listening to the harpsichord tune as we actually spent listening to the music. Um, uh, is, there, is there a... You don't really notice a difference. I was going to say, there is there a difference? You don't really notice the difference at all. No, no, no. A a I Roland did such an amazing job. It was written for broke players. And, and created preci precisely for orchestras. Yeah, exactly. And, and also um, 
by harpsichordists. They they had uh, a lot of say in how to create this instrument. So it's it's basically a harpsichord for modern times, and which is really nice because there's there's also different tunings on there that you can you know. So in Baroque era, uh, Mark was hinting at the other uh, earlier that uh, you have you know uh, different instruments and different sounds. Of course, back then you'd probably have it a half step depending on where you were in Europe, but the A would be at 440, uh, 415 hertz as opposed to today is about 440 or so. And so um, this you can, and also different tuning, it's not always well well tempered um, back then, so you could you can change that to whatever setting the orchestra is playing at. So it's a really unique instrument that I've been really pleased with over the years. Yeah, it's a phenomenal little, phenomenal little find, that thing. Yeah. Um, um, and w and and the goal this weekend is actually to have a, a really nice shot of it. Where where every concert we seem to be adding more cameras. At some point, I feel like we'll be more cameras on stage than than musicians, which should be a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> I'm looking we'll now at our cameraman who's going no. We'll, um, we'll have the musicians man the we'll cameras. We'll have the musicians <laughs> carry the cameras. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, uh, but there should we're, we're trying to get a really nice shot of the harpsichord. It's hard to set up angles and and always get what we want, but but that's one of the one of the goals this weekend um, uh, to be able to do that. Um, one of the one of the um, oh, we do have another question from the online. Uh, do you need to know a lot about classical music to enjoy this concert? Not at all. Not at all. It, maybe less than any other concert of the year. No, you just you seriously sit back. If you know nothing about classical music, you'll enjoy this. Uh, guaranteed, guaranteed, uh, and and you'll 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 see the musicians enjoying it as well. Yeah. It's funny, you know, uh, public the public really love all people love uh, Vivaldi's Four Seasons, and and what's not to love? They are phenomenal pieces of music, and they tell a phenomenal story. But I have always believed that these pieces actually are much more likable. Mm -hmm. The Brandenburgs are are just so. Uh, you know, I remember as a kid, my, my family loved classical music. I grew up surrounded by classical music. I remember as a kid, we had um, the Brandenburg Concertos on a two-disc set. Um, and, and like, that, that record got played regularly. That what's not to love about, about that music? And, and so you're right. I, d I don't think you actually need any context. There, there's a reason why they're played at weddings. Yeah. It's, it's because everyone goes, oh, I love this. Um, hilariously, they were almost lost a third time mm -hmm. uh, in the Second World War. <laughs> they were being removed from Berlin to go to Prussia to, to, for safekeeping. The train was bombed, uh, and the librarian leapt from the train with the manuscripts. That's a true librarian. <laughs> <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> Save, saving saving the works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then that happens. It seems to happen more than we w than we think in classical music, where these works. Uh, might have been lost forever, and then all of a sudden they're discovered in some attic or some basement somewhere. And this is a great example. And it happened a lot with Bach. Yeah. I mean, I I remember even as a kid in, in the 80s and 90s, like there would be new Bach pieces discovered every couple of years, mm -hmm. because he just he had such a phenomenal output of music. And it's not like today where where oh, it's the revered composer where you have this and this. No, no he was just a journeyman. He was just like this this basically servant going okay let's another work another work another work so if one got left behind when he moved to the next town yeah. oh well there's a closet there of music and the 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 next land or the landlord probably said well whatever just throw it in the trash let's yeah. go or burn it let's go yeah and i love that box music also i mean because of bec i mean uh, particularly as a pianist because it was found by uh, or rediscovered by mendelssohn uh, in the romantic era for a very long time the piano music was played very romantically um, uh, uh, kind of until the early earlier 20th century, when people like Rosalind Turek and Glenn Gould finally said, that's not how this should be played. Um, um, but that also happens in orchestral performances of it. There is, there is an over-romanticizing. I'm thinking, you know, uh, a guy named Leopold used to conduct <laughs> fairly romantically heavy Bach. Um, uh, is, is, this, is your take on it more historically informed? Uh, is it more of a modern approach to Bach? It's not a romantic approach to Bach. I know that before I ask that. So. Yeah, it's it's more historically informed, and I think um, you know even even uh, one of the violinists and I were discussing it the other day, and it, y we're we're kind of all musicians and and conductors. We're basically on the same page. Even that one conductor that had a feud with with Gene Lamont years ago, he he even is like, oh, there's some. He takes a lot of those ideas from the early music. Um, uh, um, era 
and and applies them. So it's generally acknowledged that that era that you're talking about, that romantic playing, that was more, you know, that was because the orchestras got bigger and because you did Rachmaninoff that way, that way you did Brahms that way. Well, we're playing ba uh, Bach, so this is how we play. You know, you play with long bows, you you sustain. It says a quarter note. You yeah, you go right to the end of that quarter note. It doesn't matter if it's Stravinsky, Brahms, or Bach. And of course, n nowadays um, there are a lot of nuances back then, of course, and extremely musical. Um, but there's there's a difference now with all the research that went into it by wonderful uh, players, musicologists, that we have a different view of it. And it's going to be different in 10 years. It's going to be different in 20 years. We play Bach differently than we did 10 or 20 years ago, and that's really exciting. I think, I think when we can um, continue to uh, you know, evolve our views, and for me, music is not just one way. And I don't think there's a right way, ever. There, there you can lean towards different things, but you know, even when I got heavily into the early music scene um, years ago, uh, when I was a student, still, still to this day, one of my favorite recordings is David Oistrakh, the great Russian uh, violinist playing the A minor and the E major violin concertos. And it is full on romantic and full on old school. And it is so, so musical that I love it. You know. Um, before we go, we should talk a little bit about the fact that we don't know what's happening next year. Um, uh, we've, I've been fielding a lot of, uh, not actually a lot of questions. We've been asking the question of ourselves more actually than we've been asked publicly. But um, uh, un in a very unusual fashion, we've decided to not release a season. We're, we're I'm doing a blog post going up about this later this week. But, um, you know, normally, and, and, and particularly since the 1940s and 50s, orchestras plan many years in advance. And a lot of next season was already sort of mapped out, even when the pandemic struck. We knew, we knew some of the ideas, the big pieces that were going into place. And we're not, we're not sure what will happen yet. We don't know where the pandemic's going to be. We don't know what safety is going to look like come fall. And not just safety for the audience, but safety for the orchestra as well. You know, we, we continuously, almost every single concert, adapt our protocols to ensure that everyone's staying safe. And so... I don't know yet that we're going to be able to do uh, a, a big orchestra back on stage yet by September, even with even with vaccinating. We don't know where this pandemic is going. I remember last April, uh, I remember you and I having a conversation about the fall. And still in April, we thought the fall would happen. Um, and we were still, you know, Natal in our office, they, she was still working with, with subscribers to sign up for subscriptions. And, and then, you know, by mid-May, we realized, well, that's not probably going to happen um it's it's just too hard to know yet mm -hmm. and so uh we're, we're just not going to release anything yet we have lots of plans that we're you know writing out on pieces of paper and and able to kind of pull together at a moment's notice and i think that's the other thing that we learned i hope i use the royal we as tr in terms of classical music i hope we learned in the classical music industry um that maybe nimbleness and and flexibility and thinking fast on your feet and actually being creative in the moment has more value than we thought it did. And uh, I like that you use the word creativity. I think that's that's a key because when we're nimble and when we can think on our feet and change ideas at a moment's notice, that's creativity. And that's that's when you can add new ideas. That's when you can say, you know what? I never thought of that. But someone just mentioned that last week. Let's add it to next week. And with those pre, those those times where we had to, well, we just did plan two or three years in advance. There's less room for that that nimble creativity. So I think that's an exciting thing. Yeah, big time, but less room and and, and less less opportunity for um for seeing what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, there was a wonderful story that circulated online a couple of months ago about um. Was it Edward Elgar's Second Symphony? It was a British, uh, yeah, Edward Elgar's Second Symphony, that received, uh, in its first or s uh, in its first eighteen months, received something like eighty performances around the globe. Um, in in another fine example, uh, Become Ocean, which was which was John Luther Adams' runaway success orchestral piece, written in twenty thirteen, won the Pulitzer Prize the following year, has only been played something like fifty times since it was first premiered. Because the way our industry does these things, we don't have the opportunity to just pick up a piece that's, that's hot. It's just not what we do, and, and we don't have that 
adaptability that the that the industry actually used to have and mm -hmm. used to celebrate. So I'm hoping that that's something not only that that obviously is going to inform our next year, but is also going to allow us to f to live that way going forward. Mm -hmm. um, there is something so exciting about the fact that maybe we won't know actually what what next March's concert's going to look like, and that's okay. And I think that's 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 creativity in a nutshell. Yeah. 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 We will, of course, be saving everyone's seats. So don't worry. If you're if you're a subscriber, your seat is saved. It's it's there. It's waiting for you. We will have that all figured out. But um, but in terms of of whether we'll be still just streaming online without an audience, or whether we'll be streaming with with a little bit of audience, or maybe we'll be back to the full orchestra, we don't know those questions yet. And so um, and until we know what's safe and what's actually best for all of us, we're just gonna uh, play it by ear which is something classical music isn't always good at. No. <laughs> so improvisation, <laughs> it's a skill to learn uh, during the pandemic. Thank you so much for being here, Eric. Thank you. Thank you for uh, leading the orchestra through this absolutely joyful, uh, resilient music. It's, it's got such a sense of uh, uh, Bach was here, I, uh, he is here, he will forever be here. Mm -hmm. uh, it's fantastic. A huge thank you to everyone here at McNally Robinson. Um, I can tell you I've been here tonight. I've been here a couple other times. If you're looking to go book shopping, this is the place to go because the, the, the way that they're taking the protocols here at McNally Robinson have made us all feel so safe. So mm -hmm. a huge thank you to them. Thank you to our team behind the cameras who, who are always working very diligently to keep us going. Thanks, guys. And, uh, and please join us this weekend for Bach and Brandenburg on Saturday night. Head over to saskatoonsymphony.org for your tickets. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Thank you.